everyone, and welcome once again to the Pop Culture Yearbook. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm the real Manos. And Manos, we are taking our time machine. We're going back in time once again. We're going back farther than we did last time. And what year are we going back to? We are going back to 1971. We are taking the Wayback Machine all the way there. And the most important thing that happened in 1971 was the birth of Manos. That's right. Uh, born May 11th, 1971. But Manos, lots of other stuff happened in 1971. Uh, that... Oh, I'm sure it's nowhere near as <laughs> <laughs> That's the year that uh, Mount Etna erupted. Uh, it's the year that the voting age was lowered to 18. Woo! It's the, <laughs> it's the year that uh, cigarette commercials were banned on TV. It's the year that uh, Walt Disney World opened. And uh, several movies opened, um, among them being uh, Shaft, The French Connection, and Dirty Harry. And it's also the year that uh, that uh, we first got Ra's al Ghul, and we first got Morbius the Living Vampire in comics. That's right, they're just as old as me. <laughs> you are as old as Morbius the Living Vampire. That's right. <laughs> so Manos, and what will you be doing today? Well, today I am talking about... One of my uh, favorite uh, horror films, actually, and uh, it's it's a particular strange horror film. It's called The Abominable Dr. Five, starring Vincent Price and Joseph Cotton. And uh, for those of you who aren't aware uh, of this film, it's actually one of my favorite uh, Vincent Price movies. And it's a... Uh, it's, it's a strange little film, actually. It uh, came out in 1971, and... Uh, it it it's about uh, Vincent. Well, actually, Vincent Price was one of those actors. During I don't know, there was a time when there was the types of actors who would do certain different genres. Like if you want to see a western, you go see a John Wayne film. If you want a romantic comedy, there's Audrey Hepburn, and if you want horror, there's Vincent Price, and he's pretty much the one who picked up the reins from from Boris Karloff and um, Bella Lugosi right. once they grew old. And he uh, really got started going in the 50s, and then the 60s he really took off with the uh, Edgar Allan Poe films, uh, which were a big hit for him. But uh, Fives is an interesting film because it has a really quirky sense of humor. Uh, and it, let's see, it stars Vincent Price as Dr. Fives, uh, Joseph Cotton, who was in Citizen Kane and The Third Man, he uh, plays uh, the hero, uh, Dr. Vesalis. Uh, Virginia North plays uh, Dr. Five's sidekick, uh, Volnavia. And uh, the uh, Jeffrey, uh, Peter Jeffrey plays uh, Inspector Trout, who is on the case. Uh, and uh, let's see, it's directed by, let's see, his name is Robert Faust. And he directed a lot of episodes of the British TV series The Avengers. No. Oh. And there is that kind of feel to this film, the way it's uh, shot and the way uh, some of the setups are. Uh, quick explanation, it's a revenge story. Uh, Dr. Fives is a brilliant scientist slash organist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he's also done a lot of biblical studies. And uh, he is believed to have been dead for a while, for five years, and his wife had died <clears> – <throat> on the operating table he she uh she uh had fallen sick and uh a team of nine doctors had tried to save her uh but weren't unable to when he had found out the news he rushed back and had died in a car wreck uh so someone now is killing the doctors connected to uh this operation uh the lead doctor being uh Joseph Cotton's character, and the murders are being based on the tenth plagues uh, uh, from the biblical stories. Uh, you know, the locusts, uh, bats, uh, the blood, the firstborn son, uh, and almost in a way similar to maybe the movie Seven. And uh, there's also the last death, uh, the the plague of uh let's see it was the firstborn son that almost has a quality to it almost like a death trap a lot like saw and that's a lot of uh what i hear a lot of people these days kind of compare it to and it's an interesting film because there's some fairly gory moments here in the film and there's fairly ghastly moments 
but there's such a quirky sense of humor. And Vincent Price is a really interesting performance in this film. And it, it's because it's a physical performance because his jaw has been fused shut. Oh. And he can speak. He's devised this method uh, where he can plug into a hole in his neck and connect it to a phonograph. And uh, he can speak through it. And he also has another hole where he can digest food and liquid and stuff. And he has to sort of mime. Uh, now, keep in mind, on the set, he's just not talking, and they add the dialogue later. And uh, a lot of his performance, his his vocal performance, is done as if he's trying desperately hard. To, it's, it's very difficult for him to talk. Uh, and when he's on set, when he's supposed to be saying the lines, he, he really does speak them with his eyes and even with his throat. Uh, there was actually one point where uh, Joseph Cotton and him had a scene together, and uh, line, uh, Vincent Price's line, his lines had to be read just so Joseph Cotton could know <laughs> when he could say something. Right. Because uh, it was very difficult. Uh, also, another interesting uh, idea going on in this film is Virginia North is playing his sidekick, uh, Velnovia. <laughs> Volnavia, excuse me. And she is a character that is rather mysterious. She's helping him. She's not his daughter, and she's not his current girlfriend or anything like that. Uh, there is an affection between the two, but it's not a sexual one. So there's a lot of mystery of what's kind of going on. Uh, in early drafts of the script, she was supposed to be a robot. <laughs> that was like <laughs> – that was gotten rid of. And there was actually a third film plan. There was two. Uh, there was the abominable Dr. Fives, and then Dr. Fives rises again. Now, there was a third one, and I've heard rumors that she was supposed to be revealed to be, I, I think, maybe the Egyptian goddess of death or something along those lines. So there's so many different theories on what uh, she was all about, and I actually like that. I like, like the fact that this – the sidekick has like a mysterious past that no one really knows about. And uh, what it's a really haunting film to watch. I mean, he's done terrible things, but still the way Vincent Price sells it is just so always entertaining. And he just had that way about him. And you can watch this film easy and see Tim Burton's influence all over the, over this. Oh. oh, yeah. I mean, you can definitely tell that this was a big influence on him. And I do recommend if uh, anybody is a big Tim Burton fan, or hey, if you hate Tim Burton, because <laughs> <laughs> you can watch this and go, oh, wow, that's where Tim Burton got it. That's cool. Or you could watch it and go, oh, that's what Tim Burton is trying to do. This is so much better. <laughs> I think it works either way, and uh, I just enjoy this film a lot. Um, I should also probably mention really quick, uh, just because it would be negligent not to, uh, that that was that seventy one was also the year that uh, Clockwork Orange came out, and um, I I didn't mention it earlier because I thought you might do that. Oh uh, no, good. I actually almost did Shaft. Oh, did you? Okay, cool. Oh, and actually, speaking of negligent, part of the reason why I wanted to talk about uh, Fives was this year is the hundredth year of Vincent Price's birth. He was born in nineteen eleven. Oh, cool. Yeah, and uh, I, I read that just recently, and I thought, oh, i got to do Fives. Vincent Price was brilliant. He, he was. Um, if I'm going to uh, go to uh, comics, actually, and uh, I'm going to talk about um, an important arc that isn't really brought up a lot uh, that I think is, is, worth, is worth talking about a little bit, uh, which is a Superman arc called the Sandman Saga. And, uh, Manos, I don't know if you know anything about this, uh, but this was – what's that? I don't think so. This was Denny O'Neill's run on Superman in uh, in 71, and uh, basically this was DC's attempt at um, making Superman a little more serious and getting out of the camp uh, from the, that, that had been done in the 50s and 60s. 
and uh, they were kind of trying to take him back to his roots a little bit and make him make him less powerful and more relatable uh, as as a character. Because already, I, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the complaints you hear some fans have about Superman now were already uh, creeping up at that at that point. Uh, you know, things like oh, Superman is uh, is is too powerful. How can he be relatable? Uh, he does no wrong. That kind of thing. And so so Denny O'Neill uh, took him and uh, tried to uh, go back to his roots a little bit. And so, um, it, but he didn't want to do it as a retcon. It wasn't like, oh, now now all this stuff uh, 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 hasn't happened anymore. Because the thing is, uh, at that point, Superman was doing things like juggling planets. I mean, like, he was really powerful. He could do anything. And uh, it was also, that was also around the time where you had a lot of stories with, like, Bizarro and Mixelplik and that kind of stuff. So basically, he just sort of conveniently stopped writing, uh, having Superman do anything with characters like Mixelplik and Bizarro. So, like, you know, they still existed, yes, presumably, but they just didn't show up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and and instead, um, what what he did is uh, he tried to come up with an interesting way to make Superman uh, lose those giant powers instead of just suddenly conveniently not having them anymore. And so uh, so what they did, uh, so what he did was he, he started with kryptonite. Well, Superman's only weakness is kryptonite. Let's actually give Superman a better weakness by getting rid of kryptonite. Which I thought was a really interesting idea. So what the so what the Sandman saga does is it starts off with um, the uh, it, there, there's a there's a company that decides to to uh, try to use kryptonite as um, a power source and uh, to like power people's homes and stuff. And of course, it backfires and it doesn't work. And there's this giant kryptonite explosion, which ends up turning uh, all of the kryptonite everywhere. Um, basically, uh, it basically nullifies it, and uh, it's it's uh, it's no longer kryptonite. And so, um, and so at first, uh, Superman thinks, "Oh, cool! I'm like totally 100% powerful now, and kryptonite can't hurt me, and I'm awesome." And what's neat is that uh, is that just a few pages in uh, to the first uh, uh, issue of this, and by the way, this is. Um, this is in the like mid uh, 200s of Superman, and uh, wow. and let, let me let me also mention uh, it, part of the reason I wanted to bring this up too is that this was just recently released in trade in in 09, so you can you can get this in a recent uh, really cool looking trade. Uh, but anyway, um, within the first uh, just few pages, uh, Morgan Edge, um, who's prominently featured in this, and I think this is actually his first appearance, uh, um, is is uh, is is complaining, and he's the only one who is. Where like you know, Jimmy Olsen's like, "Oh, this is great for Superman. Nothing can hurt him now." And uh, Morgan Edge is like, "But great, great power corrupts absolutely. I, you know, and uh, that's that's bad." And um, <laughs> And Superman, just a few pages later, uh, you know, he's, he's flying around saving people, and he's like, and he's like, nope, this this power is not corrupting me. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, he starts mysteriously um, becoming weaker and losing powers. And uh, basically, uh, it's because the kryptonite explosion um, uh, brought in this entity from another dimension uh, that that is basically the sand creature that took like the outline form of Superman. And every time this this creature gets close to Superman, uh, he starts to steal some of Superman's powers away from him. And um, the more he comes in contact with him, the, uh, the 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 less powerful Superman becomes. So by the end of the arc, um, when when he finally defeats the creature, the creature is gone, but he is now brought down to about a third of his power. Ooh. And he's supposed to stay that way. And so that was basically uh, Denny O'Neill's attempt at um, at at, at uh, making Superman a little bit uh, a little bit more realistic, a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, the art goes well with this too. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot less silly than stuff that had been happening before. Um, and uh, this was the um, and what's the the thing is uh, after this arc, they went back to the silly stuff again, which is really sad. Um, one of the people who had been writing before Denny O'Neill got on uh, started writing afterwards and basically just forgot about all of his stuff and then put it right back to where it was. Darkseid didn't actually appear in this arc, but Denny O'Neill's beginning of this arc was happening at the same time as, like, four other big Superman books, mm -hmm. and they all kind of collectively were trying to change the landscape of Superman. And so um, the, the whole dark side thing actually plays into this at the same time as, as, as the New Gods, and um, it's, all, it's all interrelated and connected. Wow.
which is which is pretty neat. Um, and it's just it's just sad that they kind of wiped the slate clean after that because it was a really good idea. And um, you know, it, um, I, I think you know from our modern perspective, we can look at the whole Sandman thing and everything and say, well, that's kind of a little bit hokey too. But it's not the giant cosmic hokey. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a little it's a little different. It's it's compared to what was going on, it was kind of brought down to earth a little bit. Uh, another thing that they did that, that uh, Denny O'Neill did with it is uh, he was trying to make Clark Kent less bumbling. So uh, this was that period where Clark became a uh, news anchor mm-hmm. for uh, Morgan Edge's um, uh, uh, you know news service, and um, that was that was kind of interesting because uh, now he would have to go um, figure out how to get off camera and go save people when he was on TV, <laughs> which I thought was a cool idea. Uh, but anyway, shouldn't have took that job. Yeah, well, it was one of those things where, like, he felt like he had to because Morgan Edge, uh, like, ran the Daily Planet also. Oh, yeah. So he owned the Daily Planet. So uh, if he didn't go to his news station, he was going to fire him. Mm. So he felt like he had to. That bites. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as, as what's cool about it is as, as the art progresses, um, Superman gets more and more clever because he's got to come up with, with interesting ways to solve his problems as he's losing powers and can't use his powers. So, um, so it really starts with like this, like, you know, can do no wrong kind of Superman who, um, who continually, uh, gets more and more interesting and more complex as it, as it goes on. And his, uh, his doppelganger, uh, the Sandman, um, keeps taking on, you know, more and more of his character traits as, as it progresses. And, um, I don't know, it's, it's, for, for what it was, it's a really cool arc, and um, I wish that it had been more influential than it was, honestly. Did he get to at least properly end uh, the storyline? Uh, yeah, he did, which, which, is, which is good, but then they just kind of forgot about it. Yeah. Well, it looks uh, like things really haven't changed too much, have they? Yeah, no, they really, they really haven't. Uh, but yeah, because I mean, then after that, you know, we went right back to playing around with bazillions of different kinds of kryptonite and all that all that kind of stuff um i don't know i just i think i think superman on the whole would look a lot different now had they continued in the direction that they'd started oh, that's interesting i I've, I've heard of this story it it uh, first started off called uh kryptonite no more and uh that's it kryptonite no more and that's and that's actually what the uh what the trade is called if you want to go find it it's called kryptonite no more and if you want to actually uh read the arc um I mean, I, I do encourage people to buy it because it's a cool thing to have in your collection. Um, but uh, it's actually uh, – all nine parts are actually available on uh, superman.nu. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, hey, why don't you uh, check, uh, check out uh, – what are we doing this year? <laughs> <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing this year? Uh, in oh, two weeks. 12, year, 12 different years. Uh, no, no. <laughs> in, in two weeks, we're going to go uh, to the year 2000. In the year two thousand, <laughs> we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about the year two thousand, and um, and uh, it's gonna be tough to pick something from that year. Yeah, it just uh, it still seems rather recent. Actually. Rather recent to me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, uh, Manos, we're all out of time. Oh, okay. Well, goodbye, so everybody. We'll come right back. So we'll come right back to the present. And thanks a lot for listening to the Pop Culture Yearbook. I'm Captain Logan, and I am the real Manos. And we'll see you next time. 